Well, good morning, everyone. Uh, nice to see a lot of you here. Um, as Roy said, I'm Ollie Williams. I'm a, I'm a researcher here in the Silicon Valley Lab. And if you didn't get the message already, I, I worked a little bit on the uh, Connect for Xbox 360 uh, project, particularly working on well, the skeletal tracking pipeline, which is uh, what I'm going to spend the next few minutes describing to you. <coughs> so as Roy just said, you know, we're, we're a, a geographically distributed organization and have considerable breadth and depth um, in various areas of uh, computer science and, and science in general. Um, and really, actually, what I want to try and get the sense across to you is that, that, that uh, Connect um, is, a, you know, is obviously a very recent, successful, and great case study of the sorts of things we can do. Um, and while a lot of the emphasis of my talk and uh, the product is um, on real-time signal processing and the machine learning aspect here, um, actually, a great deal of the MSR expertise uh, was brought to bear here. Um, Two examples of which would be um, work in programming languages um, and particularly in um, distributed computing, which was actually needed to do some of the training for the system, which needed us to manage huge amounts of data. And, and Mihai, who's going to be talking after me, um, will talk a little bit about um, uh, some, of the, some of the work that went into that and contributed here. Um, I think the other thing that's important for me to say right now before I forget to is that you know, MSR made a very strong contribution to the Connect project, but this was a project involving uh, you know, thousands of researchers and thousands of developers, sorry, um, and um, you know, shows a great achievement for Microsoft as a whole. Um, it's just a really great uh, case study of how um, you know, proper blue sky research can actually uh, play a role in, in, a, in a product of this um, size and impact. OK, so before I get into slightly more uh, technical details, um, I always assume that everyone knows what Connect is. I say, oh, I worked on Connect. And they go, uh, what was that again? Um, so just to make sure everyone's on the same page, um, Xbox 360 is a gaming console. It's Microsoft's gaming console. And you can see the latest incarnation of it there next to the uh, TV. Um, the Connect is a peripheral for the console that adds a pretty amazing barrage of sensors to the, to the living room environment. Um, it contains several different types of camera and an audio processing pipeline. And the whole point of putting all these sensors uh, next to the Xbox is that it enables something that we've been calling natural user interface. Um, the idea is that the person uh, who wants to interact with their computer does so in a way that is completely natural and, and, or, and ordinary to them, um, or at least more so than it has been in the past, um, so that the computer adapts to the person's uh, way of wanting to interact uh, rather than the other way around, uh, which has been you know, largely how things have been done um, previously. So the Connect actually you know, has, has an enormous amount of capability. It has this incredible audio processing pipeline um, enabling speech recognition, so you can talk to the Xbox to control it to do various things. Um, it has features such as like face recognition um, and clothing recognition, as you saw in the previous video, uh, which means it's possible for it to actually figure out um, what's going on there. But the, uh, the topic of today's talk is the skeletal tracking pipeline, um, which means that actually it can also recognize the configuration and pose of your body or bodies of various players standing in front of the device um, and use simply the motion of your, own, uh, of your own body to control the game and interpret your motions you know, as gestures for commands or to animate an avatar or various other things and somehow let you interact with the game. Um, the whole key here is that you don't have to hold anything special. None of these people are holding joysticks or game pads or wands. Um, the entire thing is that you, know, you just move around and play, and it's a much more immersive and direct experience. You walk up and go in, and this whole, the whole tagline is, you know, you are the controller. Uh, and that's entirely the, the concept here. OK, okay so uh, what do I mean by skeletal tracking? Um, so the aim of the entire system is the following pipeline. Um, we have some sensor measurements being made here on the left of a person in an office. In this case, this is just an RGB camera feed, like you might get it from a, from a, from a webcam. Um, and on the other side here, what we see is we see this sort of cartoonish, abstract representation of the configuration of that person's body. So we've taken this image of the person, reduced it to this set of um, joints and bones uh, of, a, of a somewhat uh, uh, simplistic representation of the, the skeleton inside this person, you know, sort of seeing inside them and, and, and capturing that information. Um, and one of the ideas that I think you'll see in various manifestations during the day is the idea of well, what I sometimes call the information bottleneck, the idea that we're going from a very large number of pixels a huge quantity of sort of somewhat low-grade information down to a very a few a few numbers here what's a, what's a comparatively small data structure um, but which uh, consists of very very high quality information we're sort of distilling it down and concentrating it getting it into this uh, this form that's very easy now for a game developer to digest and say well what can I do with this skeleton now I can interpret its motion I can I can retarget it to some different character in the game um, so on and so forth 
Okay, so the key, and the key thing to think about here, particularly when we get into a little bit more of the technical detail, is that this is not what I'd call a volumetric system, okay? So it's not trying to recover the shape and size of the person here, it's just trying to see into them and understand the, their, their bone shape here and, and capture that. So we're sort of reducing things to lots of these one-dimensional primitives inside, inside the system. Okay, so the previous slide was misleading because you saw an RGB, uh, an RGB feed, and when, um, when I first became involved in the project, at the time it was called Project Natal, that was its code name, and it was uh, an unbelievably secret. So after I'd you know, signed, uh, signed away my life, if I, ever, if I ever dared speak a word of it, I was told about the project and I was told, oh, Xbox are going to create a camera peripheral um, that's going to uh, watch you moving, track your body motions, use that to control a game. And I said, oh, that sounds great, brilliant, very funny, call me back when you sober up. Um, <laughs> they said, no, 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 wait, 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 no, 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 we're building a depth camera. I said, oh, fine, oh, it'll just be easy. Um, well, it will turn out that it wasn't exactly easy, but the key enabling technology in Kinect is the fact that it has, it has this depth camera in it. So here's a close-up of the Kinect device. And the salient thing that's going to be relevant for this talk is that we have these two different sensors here, which provide a particular baseline, which enables the camera to, to see in what I would call two and a half dimensions. It can see the depth of uh, pixels uh, ahead of it. So here's a representation of the sorts of thing you might get as the output of the system. Uh, here we see the sort of the frontal view where it's been colored such that um, the darker the gray is, the closer the object is, and that sort of is, is one view of it. But I mean, I think it really sort of pops out and becomes obvious what's happening when you see these top and side views, um, one of which is animated at least, uh, and you can see that you know, as this uh, person pushes their arms forward and back, you can actually see they are moving genuinely forward and back in space. And when it comes to tracking an object, which you know, is you know, not exactly made of hard contours like the human body, um, being able to actually capture these parts of the three-dimensional shape and not just looking at the two-dimensional regular feed you would get from a, from a conventional camera um, is, is, is a huge step forward in the sort of information that we can digest um, and is really you know, the big step forward in making this whole thing possible. But as I said, it's a very far from easy thing. And actually, one of the big lessons that I learned as a researcher um, coming from um, sort of working in a somewhat more academic context to actually getting you know, thrown in bodily into a big product launch was the, for certain types of problem, the, the big gap it is to go from sort of a, a fine proof of concept of some elegant ideas through to something that's actually a suitable product for, for, um, for millions of customers. Um, in particular, um, a phrase that sort of came up and I, and I, and I quite like to use a lot is, is the idea that you know, building the 80% solution is, is relatively easy. Um, and I say relatively because it's not easy at all. But getting something that seems to work 80% of the time, you know, we, we got to that point fairly quickly working on this. Um, that, last, uh, that last leg up the summit to the 99.99% .99 solution that you can ship um, is a pretty, pretty tough, um, tough way to go. And I think particularly when it comes to the schedule tracking, the, the, the sort of the number one thing that was so, um, so difficult is, is, the, is the variability um, when you have millions of people to worry about. You, 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 anything that you might assume is probably a bad assumption when you, when you extend to millions of customers. And the sorts of things that you can think about are here, where like, you know, here are some people dancing or doing yoga. So people can get into funny shapes and si shapes, okay? So you can't assume that people are all going to be standing like this all the time. People themselves come in different shapes and sizes. And a particularly interesting one here is people of different ages. Children are generally quite small. Um, and what does that mean? Well, it means that if you're going to try and solve a problem like this by computer vision, a smaller person uh, constitutes fewer pixels. And fewer pixels means they constitute a smaller amount of input data. And less data does not necessarily mean this, but uh, it generally will lead to um, less confidence in your inferences. And so making the system robust to children, who are obviously a very natural um, part of our customer base for this, was, was a very uh, important part that, that had to be taken seriously from the get-go. Things like hair, clothing, accessories obviously pose a particular problem. And then this, although it's showing a picture of camouflage in a, in a, in a color image, um, is really hinting at the fact that people also would want to use Connect in a very wide variety of different environments. Um, and being able to tolerate those environments and you know, track the person and not their couch, or what happens if the dog runs in front of me and various other things, is of course an extremely large part of the problem. And I said in the previous slide that we're not, we're not trying to recover the volumetric structure of someone's body, as these slides might suggest. But of course, that's what we measure. We measure the externals of the body, and we have to somehow translate that into the internals, into that abstract skeleton. And, and, um, and, and that really is, is what makes this so hard when you're going to have uh, millions of people using the device. 
That's one type of challenge. Another really interesting challenge, and I think that was hinted at a little bit in the video you saw before I came on stage, is the fact that the, um, the, 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 is, is the computational resources available to, to do this. We were going to try and deliver state of the art, or maybe even slightly better than state of the art, computer vision based uh, tracking um, using, um, using the Xbox 360 console. Now, this is a, you know, a modern console that's capable of delivering you know, state of the art game titles um, today. But you know, it's still a consumer product. It's it's not the same as going out and spending you know several thousand dollars on a PC and, and getting you know as many cores and GPUs and what have you as you want. So you know, it's it's a powerful but you know not a supercomputer. But that actually really wasn't the major problem. If if I could have had 100% of the resources of the Kinect available, that would have been fine. The problem, of course, is if we used 100% of the available compute resources to do skeletal tracking, um, there wouldn't be anything left for a game, and we'd be throwing the baby out with the bathwater. So the big challenge here, in fact, was that we really could only dedicate a small fraction of the compute resources to the skeletal tracking, and hence the algorithm we came at not only had to be real time, or apparent real time, and in fact, computationally, had to be very, very, very much better than real time. So that we're talking about state of the art, better than real time performance in skeletal tracking. Um, and I think this is a big part of why Microsoft Research became so heavily involved here, was because there was still an awful lot of invention that had to be done, a lot of science, a lot of triaging of ideas, um, and scheduling those in a way that we could actually uh, Compose the, compose the product and make good progress. <clears throat> okay, so I've talked about some of the challenges, but this video is actually showing the state of the project um, on the day I started. And what was really, really great about this video, which is, I think, a pretty impressive example of the system in action, um, is that it kind of works. It actually looks pretty good. Um, and it's a huge gift, because you come into this project thinking, Whew, okay, we've got, a, we've got a task ahead of us. Um, but showing this, you say, no, it's going to work. We're going to be able to do it. We're going to be able to ship it. So in some sense, we're given a gift. And this is actually the work of a, a chap called Ryan Geis, in, who uh, at the time worked in the Xbox incubation group, um, a developer on the team who, who went away and, and, and developed this system. And we, and we knew we were going to be able to make progress. And that was a huge gift. Um, but I think after you get over the excitement of seeing this working, you start to uh, scrutinize some of the details about it. I mean, to start, you have to get into a specific pose. Um, it's um, uh, and if the video had gone on much longer, you might have seen some of its various failure modes. Um, and that's um, what I want to talk about next. And that's part of this process of um, what um, I mean by going from this 80% to 99.9% .9 solution. And when it comes to something like human body pose estimation tracking, um, a really interesting issue is that of context. Um, we always love context if it's good. Um, so context in things like tracking would be very fundamental axiomatic things, like assuming your hand is connected to your elbow, connected to your shoulder. Um, and that seems like a reasonable assumption. Well, it stops being reasonable once you have several million users. I mean, that's, at some point, that's going to break. Um, and we're tempted to use much more gratuitous forms of context. So for example, let's assume that you've been tracking me for a while, and, and you see me going halfway through a golf swing. Well, OK, let's assume that I'm going to carry on doing a golf swing. Suddenly, the problem got a lot easier, because all it has to do is refine the final parts of my golf swing and get things, uh, get things fine-tuned. We've reduced the search space. We can special case some of the parts of the algorithm. And we've generally made things easier by carrying that context through time. So a lot of traditional approaches to tracking are what I would call very stateful. You know, they, they carry a lot of baggage around with them to help guide the process. Of course, the problem with that is that any small errors that creep in, even the tiniest errors, uh, can propagate under certain circumstances. And you get this avalanche effect. A few small bits will snowball and, and, and tumble and tumble and tumble. And um, soon we end up in a, in a nasty situation. And hence, these sorts of tracking algorithms have become very brittle. So imagine that I was going to try and do a parry and thrust with my medieval broadsword. But in actual fact, the system decided I was halfway through a golf swing. I'm going to be very, very disappointed when the mighty knight that was about to vanquish the dragon on the game suddenly completes a beautifully executed swing swing, uh, and um, the dragon eats me. So in actual fact, what you'll start to, f what you'll see, hopefully, in the, in the, in the next few minutes uh, uh, is that many parts of the system were designed without using context, trying to use context as little as possible, and solving many parts of the problem from scratch, which I think is a key part of the innovation here, um, is, is sort of slightly rethinking the architecture and the approach to building these systems um, in an effort to get to that robustness and get to that scale. So one part is going out context. And the other part that I think is very interesting and is, is, is very closely related to that is the management of uncertainty. And, and my contributions here, I mean, obviously, I'm just one small part of the entire project. But I think one thing I, you know, I'm, I'm very pleased about was, the, was, was really working at this idea of getting uncertainty into the system um, and being able to 
capture this principle of least commitment. Um, it's the idea that you know, if we have some sort of notion about what's happening in the system at some point in time, um, but we're not entirely confident about it, can we keep some of the possible alternatives open for as long as possible until information can be brought to bear to actually disambiguate? Beautiful in principle, but of course, by um, letting the uh, sort of size of the state grow in that way, um, that brings more computational problems and resource problems. And of course, we're right back to where we started fighting between these different things of I want lots of information, but I don't have very many uh, transistors on which to uh, process it. OK, so let's talk a little bit more detail about the pipeline. And uh, at this point, it was appropriate for me to call out a few people that I should really mention. So my contribution was actually this last two stages here. Um, I, 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 not my sole contribution, but this was where I was, I was most involved. The four stages uh, are actually, the first part is to receive the signal coming from the uh, camera. Uh, and the first stage is actually a very important part, which is to do with this background removal. It's to actually take all of the pixels from the entire field and carve it into the parts that are background and our player, and, it, and um, decide um, which pixel uh, is, is, is worthy of our attention. The next part, and this really is the special source. This is the really, uh, this is the really different thing here um, that makes it a big, um, a big change from some of the published literature, is that those pixels that have been decided to be a player are then classified according to which body part they belong to. So we actually go through a, um, a very large, um, fairly modern um, machine learning system which can actually label each pixel with a probability distribution according to which body part it works. And that was, this was the work largely of the team in Microsoft Research in Cambridge, um, who I guess they finished doing their talks of the day, um, and, um, uh, and particularly Jamie Shotton, to whom I owe an awful debt of gratitude for a lot of these slides, um, um, who developed this system. So this um, really you know, turns this pretty reasonable high-grade information into incredibly high-grade information. The next two stages are then to start moving down this information bottleneck, as I described earlier, from something that's still very much in pixel space, there's still millions of data points here, move it into body part space, and then finally into the skeleton uh, fully configured object with all the right arms and legs and, um, and things uh, that match up. Okay. So um, the first stage, as I described, was the background removal stage. Here you see it, um, the view coming from the camera. Um, Sort of the interesting talking points here in some sense are that it's capable of identifying the ground plane, so it does a little bit of inference about the uh, shape and size of the environment you're in initially. Um, and that gives it some very good information on which to try and segment you out. And you can see it's colored the players here. What isn't obvious from this image, um, but is something else that happens, is not only does it decide which parts, which pixels are background and which pixels are player, it also describes if there are more than one players which pixels belong to which player, which again is very powerful, and we can see player one, player two. And then of course signals, signals like that can then feed into the identity recognition system, um, and so on and so forth further down in different parts of the system. The next stage, this is the Microsoft Research uh, Cambridge, uh, uh, their sort of big, their big claim to fame here, and, and, and like I said before, this is sort of what is a fairly significant departure in the traditional approaches to tracking uh, is the body part classifier, um, and this has been coloured where each body part has been assigned a particular colour, uh, and this has been shaded according to what the output of the classifier thought uh, thought the various body parts are, and you can see you know a few things called out here, um, and if I show you this, this is it actually running um, on the system, a screen grab uh, of it actually running. Now, I mentioned earlier about context, and this is very relevant here. This system is, as much as is possible, context-free. It's treating every single frame independently of all the others. So although you're seeing a smooth video here, I could actually permute all the frames into any order, and it would give the same output on those, on those individual frames. It isn't carrying any information from time to time to time. And you know, it's so tempting to do that because you can make things look so beautiful when that's going well when you try and do that. And you see here, you know, we get small errors creeping in. See, these things have all got a bit mislabeled. It's not quite sure what's going on here. There's a lot of self-occlusion. It's going, oh, we could fix that up so nicely with a bit of motion. But those errors, they stop here. We go to the next frame. We start with a completely clean slate and, and can move forward. And it just turns out that for the robustness, um, this, was, this was the key innovation that really enabled us to, to break that avalanche problem um, and uh, really get a consistent basis upon which to uh, do the schedule tracking at each step. OK, so the third stage in the pipeline is to take those probability distributions over every single pixel in the image and actually cluster those into body parts. So we want to go from the space of pixels um, 
uh, hundreds of thousands of uh, data points down to some estimates for positions of the different body parts. So we actually want to try and group and cluster those distributions and estimate you know, discrete points in space for um, you know, the shoulder, the head, the hand, the knee, the foot, uh, and so on and so forth. And um, again, I mentioned a little bit about managing uncertainty. And again, one of the things here is that we don't just try and come up with one guess where the shoulder and neck are, because just in isolation with local information, we don't have a great deal of ability to figure out whether that's really the shoulder or not, because we might have various hits for that. So again, this is another example that we propagate. Well, here are candidates for where different body parts are. And of course, a nice wrinkle to that is sometimes you get no candidates for particular body parts, and somehow a foot has to be inserted into the system. And then the final part is, is, is uh, to take those estimates of where the different body parts might be and move from body part space into skeleton space and actually fuse them together. And now, even if I've got sort of 10 hypotheses for where the left shoulder is and zero hypotheses for the right foot, I somehow have to generate a complete skeleton. And that involves bringing in global information to try and disambiguate and fuse uh, all of the signals we have right at the end of the pipeline and start to make commitments. Um, and that involves taking in things like kinematics, dynamics, motion, uh, and any other information that's appropriate and that we can rely upon. Okay, obviously that was a very brief sketch over the system, and I'll be around. Um, I'll be around after the talks and what have you. If anyone wants to actually ask me some uh, some deeper questions about what's going on here, um, you know, let's just have a little recap on on why we might want to build a system like this. And obviously, gaming was the original target here. But here are all the other things one could imagine wanting to use the system for, um, and um, and there are examples of it being used like this. But actually. Um, um, these are sorts of things that we thought of before we could really do tracking to this level of quality and generality. And I think what's really exciting, and I think one of the marks of the success of the project, is where it's going to take us. You know, has it been a successful product? Well, yes, it's been successful in terms of the fact that you know, it's been a huge hit with the gaming community. But also, has it been successful in terms of science? Well, yes. I mean, there are research organizations all over the world that have gone out and bought connects and are using the SDK uh, in order to try and advance their own research agenda. Um, has it been successful with enthusiasts? I mean, that's been that that was a huge thing. I mean, you know, within days of the product being out, everyone was just going crazy for this thing and using this, this new sensor uh, in order to um, try and create all this cool works of art and, um, and uh, gadgets. And here we just have a few screenshots of the sorts of things we're using for uh, you know, various types of therapy and, and, and scientific and medical application, um, you know, which I think um, really we've envisaged uh, sort of an, the, from the past of the things we wanted to solve with tracking and um, excited about building the system and doing that. And I think it's going to be very, very exciting over the next few years to see that now that this sorts of center is available and, and in the hands of, of, of uh, creative people all over the world is to start seeing where, where people want to go with that next. And uh, I'm quite looking forward to seeing where that, where that leads. Okay, um, that's, uh, that's all I've got to say. In